Namaste. Namaste and good evening, everyone. Welcome to our continuing series, Evenings with Shadalo. Namaste. Namaste. Shadalo. Happy to be with all of you. We are happy to continue our on our theme, The Current Affairs, Part 21. And today we will continue discussing about the current world situation. And we will look ahead at, at, towards a possible imminent future. As usual, you may post your questions beforehand by sending them at our email id integralstudies.in at gmail.com or you may address your questions during our conversation on the chat box. I will read first question of Chris. What attitude should I take with people around me family and friends who have no spiritual research, who believe in mainstream propaganda and who have been injected. I still want to speak up about the reality of this world to people that are not yet awake about that, but I'm afraid of doing more harm than good if they are. I think the voice, your voice broke from the point where you said, I'm afraid of doing more harm than good. If they are premature, if they prematurely understand the elite's purpose, your voice is breaking. I think. Uh, I think your internet connection is bad. I'll continue. So he, Chris, gives two examples. Personal example: a friend that was injected, and now she gave has a hard time getting pregnant. She's I'm currently involved in fertility clinic procedures. She I'm knows that the injection was not good for her health, but she wanted to travel. She is not aware that it may be the cause. Yes. And okay. second example. One example. Okay. Can you read the second example then now? <laughs> Alina's internet connection seems to be low. Uh, so second example Chris gives, I have stopped two friendships because they believed the propaganda of the last few years. They knew my opinion on the pandemic, but it was too painful to censor myself in their presence. Yes, this is a problem we all face. And there's a point after which one learns to keep quiet and not speak up. Unfortunately, this allows for the loud propaganda to reinforce itself. Because those who believe in something deeper, truer, do not speak up. <clears throat> Always fearing that perhaps the other one may not understand or you might receive pushback. The other one perhaps thinks the same but avoids the subject because they are afraid of being hurt or receiving pushback. Uh, I have had this conversation a few times. Whenever I sense that somebody is interested in current situations, I throw what would be called a few testing words and see how they respond or what direction their thought goes. One of the simplest thing is you name one of the disruptors and see what is the reaction. And that's good enough generally to give you an idea. But on the other hand, it would be part of our work to not keep quiet, to speak up. Remember Sri Aurobindo's letter to Sahana, which I have read before here several times where he says that the falsehood, forces of falsehood are organized against the truth. And to remain silent is to allow them free play, even to allow them to take over and destroy the truth. You must speak. The question then is what you speak, how much you speak, and in what way you speak. So what is it you're going to tell them? You don't start by saying, oh, by the way, these people are wrong, those people are right. It's just someone's word against another. Uh, how much you say, you don't go all the way, you begin with a few indications. And the third thing is how you say it. Instead of saying this is so, you can say, what if? Or you start with a suggestion, I'm wondering, looking at all this, and you place two factual contradictory statements and say, I'm wondering what's going on. Something seems to be off. So if you can play, it's a it's also a skill and a tact that one will develop. 
and the other person responds yeah that also, that does not make sense and always playing staying with facts and often it is the contradiction of appearances which helps people start thinking um, and i do believe that if properly structured and presented in a way that is rational reasonable but also slowly most people will be able to recognize that something is seriously wrong and then begin to see what is the direction in which the greater truth lies the problem is if for years you have believed something it's very difficult to stand up and say i've been wrong for all these years take for example people who have become known in a certain religious tradition they have taken positions of fame and authority for them to stop and let it all go and say i was wrong this actually does not make sense and to walk out is like a career suicide and they'll never do it if you have a phd in the theory of relativity and i'm going to pick on this as one of the um, shockers perhaps we'll speak of another time but and then somebody comes and tells you that the theory of relativity is actually wrong that space does not bend and time does not slow down or speed up that is a complete misunderstanding and a misreading and you have a phd in that maybe you're a professor teaching that you will say what is this nonsense conspiracy theorist irrationality non science <laughs> nonsense and uh, dismiss you completely and yet if it is somebody who is still preparing and actually actively seeking you you might find that they start thinking differently so depending on that you would not start by saying theory theory of relativity is wrong you start by something which is not obviously threatening to their belief system and then nibble in slowly so it's a slow process and so what i have attempted in this series which we're hopefully completing the theme of current affairs today is precisely to do that although i have not gone very slow i have uh, taken the benefit of giving a few indicative examples and some references so that those of you who want to validate can also pursue your own quest of research and those of you who would simply trust uh, what i'm saying to be so without needing to double check that's fine also but when you enter deeply enough once you see the larger picture you cannot unsee it you cannot pretend any more if for centuries you were told the earth is flat and once you see that the logic does not stand and the evidence in nature is showing a nice curvature and that even it is spherical then you cannot unsee it and go back to saying earth is flat it's literally as ground shaking a perspective as that because to suddenly recognize that everything you've been told and i'm saying literally everything was wrong or was falsified deliberately by powers to keep you enslaved in mind that is a painful transition if suddenly you saw the extent of the perversion of the cabal interests at least in the elite and what they've been doing to humanity and to children and through human trafficking and the extent of it the gory horror of it there are people who having seen some certain videos and they were in the police in the fbi in the united states they saw certain videos of the elite and they were puking just seeing what what was actually being done in some of their rituals and satanic practices and to recognize that actually this is the group that controls the world's politics Uh, finances um, military sometimes uh, educational systems uh, etc uh, entertainment systems and the news it's deeply troubling it's unsettling so you can't go straight to that you go slowly in my own case from the point i had access to the internet which is now almost 35 years ago when we had dial up modems i came across some of these and it was disturbing but the evidence was strong it made sense and over time looking at some of this i began to discriminate between mixed uh, confused uh, distorted presentations of what's happening behind the scenes and things which were more rational evidence based and not merely speculative or 
mixed with speculation and this takes time so i would simply say stay with facts take small steps find out what is the entry point that works best something which is non threatening to both observing a third party somewhere in another country etc and those would be good starting points there are very good documentaries which really go deep into what happened with 911 which go deep into this pandemic you've used this word pandemic it's a play on planned pandemic and there's a documentary called the pandemic uh, so look up these because the documentary can do a far better job of presenting these things than you could will it's well researched with visuals interviews and so on so once you get into that circuit of uh, going through these kinds of documentaries uh, somebody can very quickly catch up with uh, what has actually been happening um, anupam has made this comment thank you very much for the documentary fall of the cabal and its sequence uh, and yeah that's one that's a very good starting point for many for some it will be still too disruptive but it all depends on how much uh, you you are ready to so coming to your question there is still the, this worry you have that prematurely understanding elite's purpose no it's not premature it's time it's time people woke up we cannot stay longer the other factor which is to do with that thing which was injected uh, i have to be careful what is spoken because of so i think it is important to at least start with a statement that perhaps this has caused it because there are medical studies showing this and then if the person is willing to take it up then you can show some of the medical studies and also provide a counter and a corrective to undo to whatever extent possible the effect of that thing which was inserted and this is extremely important and i would have liked to be able to speak of this much more freely i have put in today's uh, links quite a few materials one of these is on the jab which would be i hope useful for many of you and one of these particularly is the other than the side effect of the jab dr macolo who speaks of the those who want to undo the effect of the jab and i think that can be useful for many i had i have family members relatives who have been affected by that and who had a severe degradation of health seriously and from the point that uh, i put them on to this mix of three items which are all supplements the side effects dramatically dropped even to the point it seemed as if cured but one has to understand that there are means there are methods and the example i've given of dr macculo is one of those who has actually a paper which is uh, using double blind tests and published to show uh, that this this works this helps so yes please do do speak up don't wait we can go to the next question from <clears throat> from niti what is cabal's reaction to such talks on internet these days against their agenda do they see it as a threat or do they know better how this can be contained and manipulated yes <laughs> the cabal's reaction to such talks on the internet is to cancel and which is why one has to be careful of how much one speaks how one speaks and the reach if what we have discussed over these 20 episodes so far earlier was put to a group that's a few millions very likely some of the videos might have got cancelled but our numbers are small it's not threatening it doesn't matter perhaps it does not come up as a ma major red flag on their ai driven censorship or at the very least keywords have already been picked up you will see already under the videos there are now Mm, references made with websites about elections and uh, things um the effect of the jab and things like that and all of this is part of a shadow banning program that means the videos won't get promoted unless you look for them unless you know where to look you'll probably not see them and so on and that's part of their control system at the moment the control system is still mild during the lockdown it had become severe and the reaction was strong enough that they had to pull back but they have not pulled back all the way to what was before lockdown so there has been at least 20 to 30% increase in the censorship 
and maybe after a few years again they'll push forward and fall back a little bit and effectively from what was before lockdown it will be 60% increase and so on so all depends on people waking up and pushing back if we push back as a community then they cannot they cannot censor which is one of the reasons why a lot of the links i have posted are from twitter where now that censorship at least has been uh, dramatically reduced um, from the cabal's perspective at the highest levels and of course everybody knows eventually it is unsustainable because inherently the cabal framework is self destructive it destroys the earth it destroys nature it destroys the planet and so it is unsustainable it destroys the people on which it feeds so eventually they have to lose the question is for how long they've been at it for a few centuries so why not extend a few more centuries at least for the lifetimes of those who rule things and for the forces behind which we have seen always behind the humans uh, they have a much different sense of time and they can go on at it for decades for centuries uh, they don't really care they will push as much as they can knowing that they will lose one day but that one day can be pushed forward a few thousand years why not which was the threat actually with the possibility that uh, hitler might win the axis powers might win and this is what sri aurobindo warned saying it would set back evolution by 1000 years of course after a thousand years things would still bounce back and perhaps overcome but this delay would be heavy from a human point of view from a divine point of view a million years is nothing even and yet we have to do our bit and not allow things to drag further so yes do what you can and this applies to both nitin as well as uh, chris's question do what you can and always do what you can and trust that you will be helped you will be guided try out things make small steps forward and that's one of the reasons why i taken this risk also of putting it out in a certain uh, public way from the feedback we have been receiving i'm very happy and i'm very grateful also for the feedback and appreciation and i'm happy that many people have begun to see things differently and i hope just that will make a big difference also in the consciousness of humanity we can go to the next question our next question from maya can you speak about the real reason for the nuclear explosions above the antarctic regions which you mentioned last time yes <laughs> the question is relating to something mentioned in the evening series 190 which was titled secret space and there i was speaking of uh, many things including the nuclear explosions above the antarctic regions and it is very strange i said this was in 1956 that i don't remember the name of the operation was it operation trinity or something i i, I won't should not speak without verifying but uh, they exploded three nuclear bombs simultaneously at a great height above the antarctic region and this was organized with a group of if i recall right five countries united states soviet union um, france england and probably there was one more all were nuclear powers coming together in the middle of the cold war at the height of the cold war even and doing a single test together over the southern pole why it does not make sense in fact the whole point of the nuclear tests in that period and everybody was doing tests above the ground was precisely to develop their weapons in secret so that others would not know your higher technology your power of yield and capacity for various strategic reasons you don't want to know if you're weaker if you you don't want them to know if you're stronger etc so why would they come together and do this and why three simultaneously and why over the southern pole so this gets into an area which is a bit uh, quite fascinating but also a little out of the way but i'm going to touch upon it i will elaborate on this a little more and a lot of this has to do with extraterrestrial contact so i've reserved the next session which will we are completing the current affairs i've reserved the next session for the theme of many questions which have come regarding extraterrestrials life on other planets as well as dreams visions and out of body experiences so we'll see how to work that out so i'll elaborate on that but what i want to point here and perhaps if you have interest uh, i would make the book itself available i think it has probably gone outside the copyright now uh, 
but if that is the case in any case it's difficult to find it uh, as a publication today this is an extraordinary book uh, from the age of about 10 i was looking at literature of ufos and things the reason for that was uh, somewhat weird strange sometime between age 10 and 12 i looked at the future and i saw that if humanity had to survive we needed two things free energy and anti gravity otherwise we would consume ourselves destroy and from that point came this quest to discover both and how do you discover both the one place where you see both is extraterrestrial beings who come and travel to earth and identified flying objects whatever way you you choose to call it uh, if you can observe them can you reverse engineer the technology they use for example when they come they have strong electromagnetic effects nearby can you with that detect so i began to study literature of contact with ufos at the same time i went to go deep into the physics so i started reading up uh, special relativity and then general relativity and then all kinds of other things i wanted to study vectors tensors it was all about pushing the boundaries to get to the science behind to be able to understand and articulate that knowledge that was my prime driver uh, secretly so now i can speak of it at the time i would be embarrassed to speak of it but the result was i read literally all the books available at that time in the ashram library there was a z section which was the occult section and the head of library medhananda for this young fellow the section is forbidden to people but he gave special permission that i could access all those books and so i read everything available and each book had references to other books so in time i gathered a lot of material i even went into the online once the internet was available i went online read watched videos documentaries but this one book somehow was always missing everywhere i had perhaps touched saw it seen it once perhaps as a reference but never again which was very unusual because when finally i came to this i discovered this is one of the single most important books on ufo literature for various reasons which i'll explain this was written originally or first published in the year 1959 by the author who had contact with beings from flying saucers in the early 50s so he was he waited quite a while before he published before that he spoke about it and this was a human being who once walked into his house and began to speak to him saying i'm from another planet and as proof he spoke to him about their life answered his questions spoke about a higher grade of physics and cosmology spoke of moons of other planets and how there is life and how it works he described how the propulsion of the flying saucers takes place all that rich in technological engineering and physics information which was far ahead of the time then remember published in 59 and the things he speaks of which are confirmed in the 1980s 90s and even more recently for example the fact that there's water on europa and other some of these moons of jupiter and saturn and that there's actually life there and a pretty active life human like uh, it's okay we can't verify the life but the fact that there's water and that the temperatures are within range for human beings to be able to be around yes those things can be validated and explaining from the perspective of an ether based physics why and how planets rotate what determines their orbit around the earth and um, certain effects in relation to the earth and the moon the physics of it when he described the, that was the evidence in itself for example when you look at today's textbooks they speak of the moon causing the tides isn't it you've all heard this so the reality is this if the physics you are taught is correct and the moon is the side let's say this is the earth and the moon is one side the pull of the gravity should make the sea bulge in the direction of the moon or at best there may be a slight variation of a few degrees not exactly something slightly behind or slightly ahead because the moon speed varies it slightly speeds up and slows down relatively because of its elliptical orbit sometimes it comes quite close and goes quite far because of the elliptical orbit so slight variation yes but what is the reality if you observe the the evidence where the bulge should be in the direction of the moon it's the opposite it is 90 degrees off in the direction of the moon is the flat 
So when you are watching the sea and the moon is above you, that's when the water should be bulging up. No, that's when it is lowest. When the moon goes behind you or ahead of you, that's when the sea is highest. It doesn't make sense. But this book, or rather this extraterrestrial who explains the physics, gave an explanation which was so amazing, so insightful, and opened a whole new dimension of physics. The point he made was, yes, of course, there is something which looks like gravity to us, but he describes it more as a magnetic pull of a certain kind. But he says, what prevents the planets from falling is the fact that the sunlight is pushing the planets. The light is a pressure. Now, this is pure physics. It's well known. And the interesting thing is when sunlight hits a satellite, you take a satellite up in the air, just leave it hanging in space, in orbit around the Earth. The moment sunlight hits it, it starts spinning. Now, this is called Crookes tube. It is the, you've seen those little um, tubes where there are four fans and it is in a vacuum. You put sunlight on it and it starts turning. And satellites have to struggle to maintain their, or uh, prevent this kind of uh, rotation. And so he says, this is the same mechanism which makes the planets turn. But what is interesting is, it's a pressure. Now again, this is well known. The quantum of pressure of sunlight on Earth or any planet is also measurable. He says it's the pressure that keeps the planet pushed away while at the same time being pulled and the balance between these two. And the complex play of the sun, of the moon and the sun is based on the sunlight. So now here's the interesting thing. It's the reflected sunlight from the moon to earth and reflected sunlight from earth to moon, which becomes the push between them, which makes for the moon to oscillate close and far, which makes for the elliptical circle. If it was purely gravitational, the circle would have become perfectly circular, would not be elliptical. This is rational physics. But the interesting part, he says, it's the light from the moon pressing on the earth and the sea, which makes at that point for the low tide and the bulge on the sides. That was such a brilliant insight and it was so good with the physics, it corrected what was otherwise obviously erroneous. And from then on, I began to study in great depth because it requires a whole new way of thinking, a new way of uh, understanding physics. And then the examples he gave, what makes the planet rotate and the si how do you measure the size of the um, etheric surrounding um, sheath and the planet literally rolls on the size of the etheric sheath around it, rolls around us in the orbit in the sun. And the physics and the astronomy and the calculations fit in so perfectly, so beautifully, what was otherwise just arbitrary observation now has a theoretical basis and understanding. And there's so much more in that. So I'm giving this example just to show you this has hardcore physics, engineering, technology, way ahead of its time and even ahead of what is today considered acceptable. As part of that discussion, all this was to just give credibility to the claim in the book. As part of the discussion, this extraterrestrial tells Dino Craspedon, he's a Brazilian, he tells him, tell your leaders to stop exploding atom bombs out in the open air because it is extremely destructive to your atmosphere, to your life forms, and to the future of the Earth. And it's also displacing the Earth's orbit, which has a ripple effect on all the other planets in the solar system. Now, what is interesting is this statement was not only given to Dino Craspedon, it was given to at least several dozen other UFO contactees. I'm going to refer to one particular uh, researcher called Wendell Stevens, who has over 60 books of interviews with UFO contactees, one of the most thorough. This man was a lieutenant colonel from the US Air Force after his retirement or maybe part of a secret government project, but he was supposedly independent. He went all over the world and interviewed. It was he who brought out the books of Billy Meyer and so on. 60 books of interviews. I had a look at about five of them. They were all fascinating. I couldn't read the rest because of the type being very difficult to read in courier font, uh, typewritten. It's painful almost to the eyes, but we ha I have downloaded the books long ago. Among them, there were extraordinary interactions with extraterrestrials and their technologies and their lives, their worlds, and things like that. And sometimes you get those rare insights where you say, ah, yes, this could not have imagined, and yet it's validated. And so uh, as part of that, so many other contactees were given exactly the same message, including 
Billy Meyer, those who might know him from uh, Switzerland. So two things he warned about. One was he said the waste that comes from the nuclear weapons and particularly cesium and some of these uh, different uh, nuclear materials which are released in the atmosphere are extremely harmful to life. The rays they release are also extremely harmful. But these materials, he said, it's literally like putting sand into gears. And you won't see the result now, but a few decades down, what it will do to your atmosphere, it will reduce the light that comes through from the sun in your atmosphere. It will uh, change the basis of life and modify at a genetic level and uh, changing weather patterns, various things he warns about. But one of the things he says, Earth is perfectly balanced, harmonized across literally billions of years through its evolutionary processes, where all of the different creatures and plants have been harmonized to an extraordinary degree. It's beautiful. But this will break that harmony and create distortions. And one of the distortions, he says, will be a dramatic increase in extremely poisonous bees, spiders, and other kinds of creatures. It's as if they become more vicious, more hardened, more violent, more intense in their characteristics through the side effect of the nuclear particles. Now, what I've seen is I read this way back, but the data shows this happening increasingly over the last three decades that I've been watching the data and the other such observations. So what is interesting is this message was sent through many contactees all over the world to their governments. And suddenly, around, I think, 1956, all these who were doing nuclear testing of explosions above ground made a joint treaty to do underground explosions. No reason given. But at the same time, they do this in Antarctica. So I'm coming to that now. One of the side effects of the nuclear explosions and what is released, he says, it gets into the weather patterns. And it will cause a warming of your cooler portions of the poles. And it will lead to the poles, north poles melting. And if that happens beyond a point, the earth is a spinning top, remember. And you have massive cl clusters of ice on both poles. And if one side starts melting rapidly enough, it will disbalance the top. And it will cause the earth to shift in poles suddenly. A top unbalanced. Suddenly you remove a load in one part, it starts wobbling. And that wobbling would be extremely destructive to life. And the solution he offers is the only way you can counter that, he notes all your explosions of nuclear weapons are taking place above ground in the northern hemisphere, nothing in the southern. And because of the magnetic field, it traps all the nuclear waste in the northern hemisphere. So he says one counter to that, if human beings are not entirely stupid, would be to explode nuclear weapons on the southern pole at a height so that the waste on the southern hemisphere would balance out the waste on the northern and cause melting of the southern poles as much as northern pole, somewhat proportionally to prevent this wobbling and destabilizing of Earth's rotation. And remember, this is published in 1959. It was in early 50s that these statements were given to him. And he was one of those among so many others contactees, including Billy Meyer, who were asked to write letters to world leaders about this. As you know, by then, the world leaders already knew about extraterrestrial visits to Earth. They were reverse engineering flying saucers. They took these things seriously. And that came that led to the treaty by which they banned testing of nuclear weapons above ground and led to this explosion on the southern hemisphere, above the southern pole, with all these countries working together for a common purpose for Earth. Now, I am putting these two together. Having read this, when I read this, ah, this explains the 1956. Still then, it was one of the mysteries. It was unexplainable. So there are a whole lot of mysteries like this. Reading it, I say, that doesn't make sense. That doesn't make sense. Over the years, many things. And then suddenly you read something, ah, now that explains it. So Southern Hemisphere explosion, 1956, perfect timing. But another interesting thing we see, also he describes how the sunlight entering the Earth's atmosphere actually leads to the luminosity in the atmosphere. If you change the content of the atmosphere slightly, the luminosity changes. And he says one of the results of releasing this toxic uh, nuclear waste in the atmosphere would be the dimming of luminosity. And what we find, and this is again data, raw data, 
I've mentioned before, from 1956 onwards, the there is what is called the global dimming. Every 10 years, I believe it was 3% drop in uh, light of the sun entering Earth. And we have no explanation for it. All other pointers of change do not explain this. In some cases, uh, in it was in the region of Siberia, I believe, that they found it had dropped almost 30% from that point, 1956 to 19, about 2000, let's say, when I first heard about global dimming and there were papers being published about it. But it's happening everywhere. No reason, no reason, nothing that we understand has changed which could match that proportion of drop of sunlight, except the physics that this man talks about, which is fascinating. And there are many other things. He speaks about gravity, anti-gravity, etc. So to me, this is data which fits so well and it explains so many things. Of course, in some of my talks before, I've linked also this 1956 to the supramental manifestation, from which point also you see changes in weather patterns and the global dimming. Which one is it? Is it nuclear weapons? Is it supramental action? Or is it a combination of both? Or supramental action using the um, poisoning from the nuclear weapons? That's a question of technicality. For me, it does not matter. That it happens simultaneously is interesting. So this is the secret which I needed a strong, long explanation in order to be able to to be able to explain what I meant by the reasons for that were quite different. There is one more factor which gets into something quite uh, questionable, but I'm going to still do it. That you remember, I spoke earlier in one of the early sessions of this series. I spoke about Operation High Jump after the Second World War. The entire U.S. Navy and military were sent off, not coming back home to the US. Just after the war, they're exhausted and they're sent to Antarctica. And they come back with heavy losses. It doesn't make sense. Unless, and I, which I explained there, there was a part of the Nazi uh, community which had shifted to the underground bases in Antarctica. And unless the attempt was to actually defeat them in New Schwabenland and so on. There's enough evidence to prove that. We don't have to go into further details right now, other than specifics. The KGB I mentioned, they declassified files in which they actually speak of, according to their information, their intelligence, they, the US Navy was attacked by flying disks coming from the air as well as emerging from the waters. And so that gives you an idea that there was a certain very advanced technology which was being used by this, what we have called a breakaway civilization. I've used this term in the secret space discussion also. So it is also possible that the nuclear weapons used in that space were to knock out the communications and electronics of any base which might have been in the Antarctic region if there was to be an invasion of some kind. So that's one of the secondary possibilities left on the side. I do not know. So it's speculation. I leave it at that. Normally, I don't speculate. But uh, having spoken of all this, it would not be complete to also leave behind uh, something a bit speculative. but very likely also. So I think that is the answer I would give to Maya's question, the real reason for the nuclear explosions above Antarctic region. It was also for them a test. Everyone knew that nuclear weapons exploded high enough in the atmosphere would create an electromagnetic pulse, which would destroy electronics. That's known. But what was not known was to what extent, how damaging would it be? And this test above the Southern Hemisphere showed something extraordinary. The higher you went in the explosion, higher in the air, the more damaging the effect, because from the highest portions of the atmosphere, there was a chain reaction. The electromagnetic pulse triggered an avalanche, so to say, of electrical and electromagnetic impulses, which amplified the result all the way to the ground. And so this is one of the things which are which people are very much afraid of, the use of nuclear weapons high above a country. But the damage is not just to one country below, it is to such a large region that nobody would do it unless they were already on a suicidal mission to destroy the earth or human civilization. But this is just to show you there are things like this, and this is everything I'm speaking of here is recorded documentation of those tests. I think we go to the next question. Our next question is from Hema. 
I've been following your current affairs series with great attention. I was earlier talking about the new world order and the plans of the cabal, but never had the conviction to know that these are not theories until you spoke out. You referred to 2024 making the end of the Kali Yuga and the beginning of this Satyoga. Could you let us know what kind of shift, shifts would happen? And so on. And I'm just very intrigued and have a sense of wonder of being born an in. Born in India at such a time. Yes, so <laughs> this is going to be the theme for today. And I will start by reading something Sri Aurobindo wrote in response to a question. We don't have, unfortunately, the full text of the letter to which he is replying. And it is dated April 1950, Sri Aurobindo's response. And it's just before he, a few less than a year before he leaves his body. Sri Aurobindo replies to the letter. You have expressed in one of your letters your sense of the present darkness in the world around us. And this must have been one of the things that contributed to your being so badly upset and unable immediately to repel the attack. For myself, the dark conditions do not discourage me or convince me of the vanity of my will to help the world. For I knew they had to come the dark conditions. They were there in the world nature and had to rise up so that they might be exhausted or expelled so that a better world freed from them might be there. Now remember all the very ugly dark things we shared earlier about the Kabbal, their practices, etc. have been going on for centuries. They were buried below the appearances. If they had to be ended, they would have to be exposed first unless people got to know, unless the thing came up sufficiently that one could actually arrest the people, remove, educate people, or expunge that from humanity's future. For that, it has to come up. And so you have to understand the rationale and the way things happen. So do not be discouraged. Rather, take refuge to what Sri Aurobindo describes now. They were there in the world nature and had to rise up so that they might be exhausted or expelled so that a better world freed from them might be there. After all, something has been done in the outer field and that may help or prepare for getting something done in the inner field also. He gives an example. For instance, India is free and her freedom was necessary if the divine work was to be done. The difficulties that surround her now and may increase for a time, especially with regard to the Pakistan imbroglio, were also things that had to come and to be cleared out. It's interesting, if you look at it this way, had India been free without partition, the conflict between what was the group that considered Islam as a nation in itself would still be there with others, but perhaps less intense, less hardened, less damaging to India's uh, spiritual mission and future. But it would be there. It would have to be dealt with. It has come out in a prominent and somehow painful way, which has seriously disrupted India's own growth. But so you understand how, how it works. It was still there. It would have had to be dealt with perhaps differently. Then <laughs> Sturbindo writes, Nehru's efforts to prevent the inevitable clash are not likely to succeed for more than a short time. And so it was not necessary to give him the slap you wanted to go to Delhi and administer to him. I don't know who he's writing to, but someone who wanted to go and slap Nehru. And Sri Aurobindo continues, Here too, there is sure to be a full clearance. Though unfortunately, a considerable amount of human suffering in the process is inevitable. You see the foresight, writing in 1950, 70 years after, 75 years after, that suffering has still been going on. It has become much less now, but then he continues, afterwards, the work for the divine will, the work for the divine will become more possible 
And it may well be that the dream, if it is a dream of leading the world towards the spiritual light, may even become a reality. So, I am not disposed even now in these dark conditions to consider my help, to consider my will to help the world as condemned to failure. And from 1950, it's not that he stopped, he has continued working from the higher planes. And the circumstances of today are still held, guided by the divine help at every moment. But for the divine help to be effective, it needs more and more conscious receivers of that influence. Centers of light, centers of clarity, who can not only see the truth, but act by the truth and live by it more and more. So I leave it at this first as a starting point for our discussion. With this background of what Sri Aurobindo has to say, let's look at what I have named here as future hopes. From a certain point of view, there are certainties. But for now, there are hopes because we cannot obviously see that this is going to happen. Although in the way I will describe it, you will see that it is inevitable. Then it's just a question of time. So first, let, let's review the present condition of human life. And to really appreciate what I want to describe as the future hope, you need to so-called decondition yourself from a way of thinking and looking at life, which is so deeply ingrained by your education that to think outside that becomes almost scary or disruptive. You lose your references because you've been taught to think with blinders. For example, throughout your education, what is it that you're thinking of as your future? I will get good marks. I will grow on increasing in marks. I will come first, second or whatever. I will come better than others in order to scramble to get the best job, best paying job. That's your programming. If you fall short of the best paying, you are not the best. You are somehow inferior. If you don't get that at all, well, you just get whatever job is available. doesn't matter what. Get a job to survive. You've been brainwashed with these blinders to think in that very narrow groove. Unless you're wealthy enough, you have the money, now you don't need to take have a job, you can live your life as you want. But what's the goal of the job? To get the money. So if you have the money, you don't need the job. But to get the money for what? So that with the money, first you will survive. You can buy the food you need, you can get a house, shelter, whatever it is. Survive. Then if you can, make yourself a little more comfortable. And then third, if possible, you can do the things that would make you happy or which you think will make you happy. It goes in that sequence. Job to get money, money to get survival, survival so that eventually it can grow to some comfort and then eventually do the thing for which you feel most worthwhile. You see the complete reversal of the value system. We should have started with this. What is it that would give you the deepest fulfillment as a result of which you will find your life becoming meaningful, which will automatically translate as comfort. And with it, naturally, it should follow that you will have all the necessary means. And if you need money to make transactions, yes, it's there. It's not a problem. But you will not be scrambling for a job. You will already be doing the thing which gives you fulfillment instead of doing the thing which is the very opposite in order to come all the way back to your fulfillment. So I'm going to reverse this completely. And in so reversing, it's difficult for you to think what that is like. Because always at the back is this deep programming. I need the money for my security, for my food, for my house, for day-to-day -day survival. If nothing else, even if you own a property in which you grow food, you have to pay money to tax to the government for the land that you hold. Isn't it? You still have to keep giving something or to exchange to barter. You have to buy your mobile phone where you still need the money. You can't just live on the food that you grow. So when I reverse this totally, bear with me. Some of the things won't make sense, but then you need to review this multiple times and then it will start making sense. So rather than going in small steps, I'm just going to turn everything upside down and prioritize in a different way. But before going into that, Look at why you need the money. Because with that, you're going to buy those goods. Why couldn't you get the goods on your own? Think about it. 
for now for example the government of india buys grains from all over the country in what is called the msp the selling price whatever that m is for they buy stock up in godowns the quantum they stock up 30% of it goes into rot unusable and it's held as a buffer stock in case the prices ever go too high it will be released to maintain price now here comes the dream of communism if somehow we could match the need and the production then you could just grow all that and give it for free well you would pay the farmers but what you pay would come from other things which these people do by work which would fill the pay and so everyone would take care of everyone else that's the dream of communism you see that in a smaller scale in many spiritual communities monasteries in the shri aurobindo ashram for example where there's no exchange of money internally everyone does what they can collectively or looked after etc in oroville mother said something similar eventually no need for money but in the beginning in the transitional phase you would use the money so somewhere that ideal always pulls you back to what if we can just get rid of this need for money and look after each other which interestingly happens in a smaller villages every time you have let's say an orchard it's given thousands of mangoes how much can you eat well all the neighbor children come and we all eat and still there's plenty so that excess you take and sell off in the market in exchange for some money with which you buy something else so let's say you could create and just as a way of thinking a community where there's the guy who produces mobile phones there's a guy who produces mangoes there's a guy who produces rice there's a guy who um, repairs computers whatever it is all the things you would need and you make a circle in which everybody is looking after everyone everyone else of course proportionally some may be required to have more or less in numbers you could have such a community if there was the characteristic of the fraternity and a spiritual fraternity you could actually all live doing what you enjoy doing and thereby contributing to the society and still receiving all the benefits not needing to buy anything so first i'm getting rid of the money as an inevitable necessity as a logic but still you need two things you need the electricity to run your machines you need the raw materials to process to make your things so obviously for food you don't have too much trouble but if you had to build a mobile phone you need to make the chips to make the chips you need this technology you need to run it with electricity you need the chemicals with which you will prepare all the materials and so on so let's say we put all that together now expand your community to include all those things including those who are mining who in their right mind would want to mine and slave away at mining there's your first problem so there are jobs which are extremely uncomfortable extremely uh, distressing harmful or sometimes even in terms of false value of status you might say inferior but there are people who might enjoy it the numbers may be small shri aurobindo makes this very interesting observation when he speaks of the four varnas the four kinds or types of soul powers um, upon which human types are based he says it is by a certain providence of wisdom that nature makes the worker type larger in number so there's a kind of a pyramid in terms of numbers those who seek a higher abstract knowledge philosophical or, or research science etc are relatively small in numbers and down the chain and those who work on the ground are relatively large she makes the types in that proportion so you see there's an underlying wisdom in which even humanity is so to say um, distributed in its numbers but still that's not an answer because you still have to get the resources and there's work always which is uncomfortable and there'll always be imbalances sometimes more sometimes less as you see in the forests sometimes the total population of tigers is much higher than the deer and some of them tend to starve until the population balances out in nature we can accept that with a human conscious mind you cannot accept that you need to do something to maintain a more rigid strict balance and perhaps a leeway a comfort so comes now three things which you need energy labor and raw materials 
if you don't mine you cannot get the necessary metals for example and all those are difficult so you need the labor and all this processing subsequently is energy intensive these three things if somehow these three things could be taken care of your reasonably complete community would not have any stress or distress and would have a plenty now reduced it by bare bones to just the broad basic requirements i'm sure there are finer uh, aspects and elements it's not important these are the main things so let's stay with the main picture let's look at each of these energy labor raw materials and then there are people and people who love to do it but maybe they're not enough in numbers but that comes back to the question of labor so let's look at these three you remember what i started earlier with uh, free energy and anti gravity well the free energy as it happens is actually accessible is freely available to us with the technology that already is known and i've mentioned this before a website above unity is one of those sites where you can actually go and get um very detailed explanation of the physics and the technology by which you can replicate by yourself the free energy machines it's called aboveunity.com i've put that as one of the links i put it before but i would highly recommend those of you who are interested in electronics and who have some interest in doing things at home please go to that learn from there and there's a big button that says start here that's where you start but at the very least study the rationale because it's very reasonable and the whole thing rests on making asymmetry all of our technologies are built on symmetry so your push and your push back are balanced if you change the electronics or the electromagnetism to make to become asymmetrical you can draw out more than you put in because it's an open system you're not really generating energy i've given this as an example if air does not exist a windmill is a fantasy if air exists and there is wind then a windmill is your free energy machine take it a higher level if ether does not exist there is no free energy if ether exists and there is an ether flow that's your free energy machine how do you tap into that ether flow very simply by pulsing electromagnetic fields and by making coils resonate it's very simple in fact because the let's put it this way the ether is vibrating at a certain frequency you tune into that and by resonance draw that energy effectively and convert that into something and there are several ways of doing this and they're all cheap easily accessible so let's assume now the technology is available it's simple enough cheap enough has no moving parts that you can have a little box to feed electricity the mother spoke of this i've shared before when i asked pranab that did mother ever speak about uh, future sources of power electricity she said yes in future they won't need all these wires between houses you know we had those long wires hanging and every storm the wires would break and there would be blackouts is she said every house would have a little box and he made a gesture about this size and then he said and it would emit blue light she she told him and that for me was perfect because that's ionizing light because i saw high frequencies and uh, high high voltage electric fields perfect it was a perfect description of so much that we have seen from Tes- from nikola tesla down to chris sykes who is the currently the head of this uh, who owns this um website in australia and you don't need high voltages for running your house there are many simple ways i have also shared how i saw free machine in uh, free energy machine in um, switzerland in a spiritual community so let's assume now this technology is simple enough that tomorrow you are given the plans if you have basic skills with electronics you can wind coils put it together and have a little device that gives you the electricity you need first problem taken care of what's next labor and raw materials you see the work that uh, 
Elon Musk is doing major disruptor. Remember all the things I listed. The thing which I did not list in our discussion so far, which is somewhat new in his work, is the robots he is building. He has called his robot Optimus. This is a human-like shaped robot which can walk, which can fold clothes, and eventually, with improving artificial intelligence, do practically any human task. Maybe slower to begin with. but in certain respects more efficient more rapid because he can continue day and night all he needs is the electricity which is now free so if your robot now with your artificial intelligence is brought up to a certain standard and we are not too far from it we are seeing it actually happen then your labor becomes free remains now the raw materials who builds the robots of course in time you see most of elon musk's factories are automated in time the robots will build the robots all you will need is to provide the raw material from the mines so a certain standard of steel and plastics or whatever else you need as uh, raw materials to put together so you come back to what is the bare necessity raw material and then you have with artificial intelligence and sufficiently developed robotics a self sustaining assembly line producing the robot workers labor driven by free energy now this energy factor you must understand is so critical to any economy it is in fact the hidden cost which makes most economies so uh, expensive i give an example of compare the united states economy with the indian economy in india the cost of petrol is kept very high and the government's excuse for that has always been that we are buffering the variations in cost in the united states the cost of petrol is kept very low though earlier they would import from saudi arabia they have under trump it became a glut it was a net producer across the world gas prices went the lowest what is interesting is it has a chain effect because everything in human life eventually comes down to energy requirement everything no exception even the plastics and raw materials you have are finally based on oil so it comes back to that chain and because there is a pile up effect each process adds some more electricity consumed some more power needed in building anything you have a 10% drop in oil prices and if you have a 10 step process in a chain you would probably end up with a 100% drop in price that's the scope of an importance of energy we don't it's not like 10% drop in energy price will give you 10% drop in your goods no because the goods go through multiple layers of energy processes each layer now needs 10% less in cost so put 10 12 whatever number of steps and you'll have a 100% drop in price effectively price would become half now uh, this is just to give you an idea of how critical that energy price is in india for whatever reason this was part of the nehruvian socialism and the irrational economics which now have been largely undone or modified or corrected largely not yet fully the prices were kept so high that you had to struggle to survive because of this and every time the prices were brought down there was a relief in the entire economic framework and it was the government eating up all that excess for its corruption and whatever other reasons so if you could somehow get rid of that entirely let's say now your gas prices from whatever they are become zero you see the ripple effect it has on the entire economy many things would actually become one tenth their current cost so you'll have a shock now if prices drop so far so low what happens how will you earn enough to buy your food that's the part you need to break out of that line of thinking you don't need to earn because everything is already available to you remember so we're coming back to that now but take out this idea of needing to earn money in order to survive or to get basic requirements so energy going down to zero labor becoming dramatically lower because it's the cost of a high quality optimus robot built by elon musk or its equivalent uh, made in china for one tenth the price 
or with a jugad within India for one uh, twentieth the price doesn't matter. The net result is that free energy combined with free labor, and now the dramatic drop in prices suddenly makes everything affordable to everybody. Now it remains a raw material. And then we have the food and water, etc., for survival needs. But raw material. So some of the raw material is grown. For example, for clothes, you'll have cotton grown or synthetics and so on. Uh, but some of it has to be mined. So there you have again your robots who will do the mining far more efficiently than you, which anyway largely now machines do, but still things require specialized human interventions. With the AI of today, which is so advanced. This is a breeze. It's not a problem at all. All you need is that high quality robot who is stronger, more hardworking and does not break down. Made of steel, body of steel and no risk, even if there's a cave in. And your raw material becomes effectively nearly free. Of course, there's a cost to the environment. But let's assume now that we're going to correct for it. In the United States today, we find the statistics, and my statistics is now is about 10 or 15 years old. We are told that a typical American buys the 99% of what they buy, they threw away within six months. This was a culture of waste which was promoted in the United States, and through that, made an example for the rest of the world to waste. In India, I've seen this happen in the last 20 years with much distress. All the packaging that comes. With anything you buy, food, bags, plastics, uh, cardboard boxes, anything. Packaging to make beautiful so that you'll pay more to buy, which immediately on arrival you take out and throw away. Sometimes it's plastic, it's thick plastic, it's lots of paint, colors, uh, materials mined to make those colors of paints just thrown away. And you have to review that. Do you need that fancy packaging? Sometimes. If it is, then make sure that is recycled or reused. Why not? It's very easy to do. But the thinking in that direction has been blocked. And we need to correct that. For example, everybody who comes to you as a courier delivery, take out the packaging, send back the packaging with him. And he has to necessarily go back anyway to pick up his next courier delivery, he gives it back there eventually. The same chain for bringing things to your house can go back and return packaging which can be reused. And I don't mean recycled, reused. Recycling again has a waste cost, but not to worry because your energy is free as long as you don't destroy the environment by, by produce which is poisonous. Let's look at that question also. There are certain industries which, which produce chemicals which are poisonous. Most of the time, these produce are dumped into the sea, air, or soil. In Punjab, they banned for chemical from industries to be thrown into the river. So what did the wise uh, businessmen do? They dug a hole into the ground and pumped it into the ground and buried it. It went into the aquifers and damaged the water for good, which makes for the Punjab to have the highest cancer rates in the world practically. Why did you do that? Because it was too expensive to process the chemicals to make them harmless. And where did that expense come from? Because of the cost of energy, because the cost of raw materials for the chemical reactions. Once your energy is free, once your basic raw materials are now, let's say, one-tenth the cost or nearly free, all industrial waste can be easily reprocessed and by law, to make into harmless produce, which can then be sold as raw material for other parts of the industry. In principle, this is possible. The only reason it cannot be done is the cost of energy, which is too high and makes all your products that much higher because of the energy price. Make that zero and all this becomes reasonable, doable. Remember still, you're not selling things to live. We're going to come to that. You don't need to sell things to live because now everything is coming down so low in price with your raw materials and your free labor from the Optimus robots and free energy. You create now production lines for all basic necessities and luxuries. No problem. But let's start with basic necessities. 
uh, you need a television today that's almost like a requirement you need a computer or a mobile phone perhaps let's consider that a basic necessity at least for the education of your children for your day to day living for online purchases whatever it is so you have an assembly line that's producing it completely automated robot you have your raw material coming your electricity coming and you have human beings maintaining it people who love the job so much that they enjoy doing it and they enjoy improving it let's say or eventually replace them with robots with ai which repairs itself no problem so you can produce enough mobile phones that could go to every human being on earth now you make them such that they are future proof for at least 20 years so you have over the air updates every now and then when technology improves sufficiently you will replace them and you will pass on to your children a lesser grade of technology while you get the best whatever it or the other way the point is all this is effectively coming to you free your waste now goes back into a recycling process which is energy intensive but the energy is free remember so all the waste is reduced to harmless materials and effectively then with a bit of long term planning you will have near zero waste and goods for all now there will be luxury goods for which you may have barter or money exchange but you won't need the money to survive so you may for example as an artist produce very beautiful paintings that are highly valued and exchange for somebody who produces a very high quality something which he wants to gift you or you route that through a money process of valuing no problem you don't need to eliminate money there's nothing wrong with money being there it just you're not dependent on money to survive now comes the big question what happens to people in such a situation you have a choice at this point when you see you don't need to earn money to do to live to survive you can actually have a reasonably comfortable life doing nothing at all at that point you have a choice either you degrade or you say now i'm free to grow this is the crux of the human problem today all the other things are secondary so in a sense the rat race is useful to make us grow out of our inertia to increase the rajas in order to aim for something higher even if it is well higher price higher position higher visibility whatever your immediate objective would be but if humanity can outgrow that need for a very superficial sense of um, importance you can focus on the things which give you the joy and the value of living so you won't need to earn have a job to earn money you can innovate freely and you can say you know what i'm looking at this mobile phone i'm going to work on improving the software and you become part of the community which is improving the software for free because you love to do it and don't worry if you don't there are others who would love to do it and those who love to do it will do it come what may and maybe they'll make other innovations improvements and so on and you will have a let's say mobile phone in which you could pick someone made an android someone made an apple ecosystem someone made a third ecosystem i say okay why not i'm going to try that one you're free to because it's all available so you see here something very interesting the ideal of communism is made accessible in a way that is not imposed there's no compulsion on you you don't have to be a slave worker inside this machine in order to continuously help others it's taken care of by the robotics and the fact that energy is free has dropped all costs to something so low that you need only look after the very highly skilled labor and very specialized raw materials all other rest can be automated dramatically you have plenty for all into this now we look at what's left for survival you need food and water and land so let's assume you have the land if not you look at the world there's enough land for everybody you want to live in a city you want to build a skyscraper many people say i don't want to i don't need to or some will say i want to i want to be in a place where i'm surrounded by like minded people fine 
So even the construction can be partly automated or there will be people who are willing to do it and you will have a exchange of some kind of barter. And again, I'm saying no problem with the money. You will do things which you like to do, but it will be liking to do, not being a slave where you do something you hate doing. Into this now, add automated deliveries. So the person who comes to give you your purchase online, who will take away your packaging material, is now a robot or even a flying hovercraft of some kind. It brings it to your house, delivers it, and goes away taking away whatever waste you have. Automated. Now think of what happens next. You want your food. That's coming. You can buy it. Or you grow it. You need water. You can pump it out. Or with free energy, you can extract water from the air. You can go into a desert land and you'll be surprised how much moisture actually exists even in the desert air. And you can easily produce one bucket full of water every hour or two, depending on uh, spaces. Because your energy is free, remember. So your machine is actually like an air conditioner. It's cooling, heating, expanding, contracting the air and squeezing out the moisture from the air. And here you have all the water you need. You, need, you are left only with food. And there are people who love to grow food. Some of you might be those types. And you're free to grow it in your own, own way at your own pace. And the base, the beauty of it is nature is so abundant. You grow one plant and you can take your time. It grows with so much. It gives so much. You have more than you could consume. And you start sharing automatically as in a village. So what's left now? You have enormous amount of free time. What are you going to direct it to? that will now define your civilization or rather your civilizational values will define whether this model survives or destroys itself. <laughs> Inevitably, if humanity has come to that point where we recognize the importance of um, growth of consciousness, you have a model that comes very close to what mother wanted for Oroville. Isn't it? In fact, Oroville could be one of the very first such models of a community where automation combined with joyful participation of creative production of all kinds could be self-sustaining. Using money where needed as an intermediate uh, system for simplifying the barter process itself, but no compulsion, no requirement, and you would have all the basic necessities. This is doable as we are today, right now, with just the free energy, and with uh, reasonably good robotics. Let's assume the free energy is not yet efficient enough. Let's assume the robotics is not yet so um, advanced. You bring back a little bit of the human participation and some electricity, let's say, from solar panels and so on. And you already have the same model sustainable as it is today, slightly reduced in the degree of luxury, but doable. And that's what Oroville was in its early days largely self-sustained. A lot of discomfort because you're still building the infrastructure, but to the extent the infrastructure kept building, those discomforts were reducing and you had a sustainable community in this way, but on the basis of a spiritual ideal. Remove that and then you have the mess that comes with any community with non-spiritual humans or thinking animals bring back the deeper spirituality, and suddenly, despite the discomforts, the whole thing becomes a sustainable and a beautiful and mutually caring, supporting community. Now, you can see how this is well within reach as we are today. Of course, it can be perfected much more and will be inevitably things will go in that direction. But the warping is the complete reversal of values where you're first chasing money rather than starting with what fulfills you and your growth of consciousness. But for this to be a starting point, you have to have some basic assurance. So there's going to be a kind of a destabilizing process in the economic framework as it is for this complete reversal to take place. What will happen is these technologies will come in. Suddenly, some people will realize, oh, I don't need to do all this and drop out and switch to a different model. Others will say, no, that's too insecure. I don't want to take a risk. And there'll be as if a split in humanity. And more and more will switch to the other model 
and eventually replace the other that's how one could based on historical past uh, t- trends one could foresee the emergent future i've still not come to the real real part which is the change that comes with anti gravity into this now with all the free time you have you introduce anti gravity and the nature of anti gravity you must understand is something quite uh, mind blowing i will put it in this way if you have a car which you want to make fly how much energy will it take to lift it and to make it fly if you take the example of your engines which are running the wheels you don't need that engine you have an electric engine you drop the engines each wheel has its own motor built into the wheel itself drop the entire transmission system the gearbox engine um, etc the entire weight of the car drops to less than half of what it is automate the electricity you have a free energy little device giving you all the electricity you want your car can be let's say one third the weight you need weight only for strength in case of crash collision and you can go pretty much anywhere on earth driving freely do not yet come to anti gravity it's just car with free energy and you can drive to anywhere if you have to lift the car now with that electricity how much would it take and here's the interesting thing the electromagnetic field is 10 to the power 38 times more powerful than gravitation meaning 10 followed by 38 zeros is such a humongous number we can't conceive of it in other words an electromagnet which is run by a 9 volt battery has enough pull to lift your entire body okay for a few seconds but at least the strength is strong enough i replace the 9 volt battery by free energy and you have a little thing like this with an electromagnet which can lift the full weight of your body let's extend that to a car now which is one third of its current size and weight and maybe slightly bigger electricity production slightly bigger electromagnet can lift the full weight of the car now if this electromagnetic field can be properly pulsed it can be harmonized to an ambient frequency which is already present and it can ride waves like you ride a surf surf on the sea you have a wave you stay on the edge of the wave that is falling and it pushes you consider that right now you're surrounded by a certain frequencies of waves typically in the range of 3. Point something gigahertz which is the natural resonance frequency of uh, electrons you tuning to that frequency it's resonating everywhere you tuning to that frequency and play the phase of the frequency and you can basically move in any direction that you choose get lifted but with that strength of the electromagnetic which can lift your whole weight of the car with a little machine which is producing the free energy or a 9 volt battery you can lift the entire car and take it in any direction freely overcoming gravity effectively let's say for the moment even that technology is not perfected we don't have free energy that car battery which you currently have lead acid battery can produce enough electricity to lift the weight of your car with electromagnetism that using as a propulsion can take you all the way to the moon and back with the current charge of a battery replace that by a free energy machine and you can go back to the moon back and forth multiple times unendingly how much time by the way based on this very simple propulsion you will reach the moon in about an hour at most so here's your car you can drive it on the road or you can take off and go straight to wherever you want on earth and with a bit of isolation from the air that you make it air tight strong enough you can go outside the earth the exact same technology which could take you anywhere on earth So if you could go anywhere on earth where would you go of course you'll have a huge problem with all tourists wanting to go to some beautiful place and ruining it that's where the change of consciousness becomes critical let's say we all say i want to go to gangotri imagine half a million people wanting to go at the same time no it's not going to be any more what you thought it would be and you would destroy it so how are we going to manage humanity 
that's your bigger problem not the technology not the comfort not the survival will can we as a species grow in consciousness that we don't just destroy ourselves because of this freedom that we have see where the whole thing points to it inevitably points to a necessity of growth of consciousness then i'll just complete this part you could go anywhere on earth where would you go without destroying that place without having a million people suddenly assembling there and you can see now the way humanity thinks and values things becomes so much more important but you don't need to go just on earth you could go anywhere else you could go to the moon you could go to mars you could go to one of the planets of jupiter which is inhabited by others human like or if it is not inhabitable with oxygen you wear your space suit and go and explore and come back if from the moon it's one hour you could go to mars let's say in 3 days to venus even less one and a half days one day perhaps you take a flight around the earth today that's enough to get you to venus one way spend a little while come back this is doable <laughs> with this just what we have been describing and it's so simple it's so cheap and it's accessible to everybody you have a revolution of the way humanity lives possible right now today as we are far more advanced technologies have been developed some of them reverse engineered from crashed sources available in the black projects and i mentioned in the time before last the secret space program it's already there the problem is is our humanity now competent enough to make use of this freedom that's the bigger problem and this is often used as a justification for the breakaway civilization to say we can't share with that animal humanity or by the cabal to dominate the animal humanity saying we are superior they are as good as animals so they are worthy of being dominated or being enslaved except it becomes a self fulfilling prophecy you ensure people grow up with this wrong idea with your education becoming progressively worse to reduce you to an animal consciousness and that's why the solution is going to be to push back and rebuild our education rebuild our values rebuild our society to whatever potential which is high enough that not only we could rediscover these technologies or gain them or even break this artificial division between the breakaway civilization and the trapped civilization let's say all doable as we are the problem is of change of consciousness and hence you will find in sri aurobindo's and the mother's writings they don't focus too much about issues of of technology yeah he sri aurobindo uses the words the word technology not being so current then he uses the phrase human ingenuity human ingenuity will do this solve that problem resolve this issue but that's not the point the point is having done that what are you going to do with that new found freedom or capacity will you go to mars or maybe you go to europa moon of uh, jupiter and find some animals in their ocean will you shoot them trap them kill them as they say they call it game on earth when they will see animals going into the woods and take a gun and shoot them well for the pleasure of it well sometimes to eat but mostly for the pleasure of it they call it game when you go to play a game that's the same word will you do that to other species or would you be refined enough to say hey this is interesting if i can love my earth animals i can love any extraterrestrial species superior or inferior is irrelevant now so this shift in consciousness where you actually begin to care for other animals on earth as your family where you look upon nature itself as your mother where your purpose for living is not some aggrandizement or domination of others but a fulfillment of your own potential and growth and joy in growth of consciousness unless you have these shifts this future that i'm describing which is so easily accessible would not be possible or we would be prevented from reaching it because of the inevitable misuse that it would be accompanied with so there are actively powers which restrain which hold back and they are not necessarily human powers not necessarily asuric powers though they may do that but even divine powers which may restrain and say ah 
not beyond this until you grow in consciousness just look at the example of what happened with the new technology of mrna which would allow you to change your genetics by just sticking a needle in and how it was misused just a few years ago when that could be used to cure cancer even perhaps on some level to improve the human potential but look at the misuse to enslave and subjugate so all of this points to the necessity of human evolution change of consciousness and so i'm coming back to this now as our focus you have the freedom to explore the whole universe outside you but for that freedom to be available to you without being misused you need to begin to explore the universe inside you and overcome something of your animal past come to at least a higher human grade of consciousness and then all these gifts which are waiting will be given to you literally by the same beings who preside over human evolution who will help this to happen when shri aurobindo and the mother spoke about the future they were fully conscious of all these possibilities and that's why they did not bother with the technological aspects in passing you will find all kinds of references where shri aurobindo foresees the future including machines by which they can read your mind and so on it's all there in the the canto of the four soul power of the the triple soul powers is it um where you have the warp echo speaking of what it will what it has achieved and what it will do and so on technologically and otherwise psychologically but all that being visible the primary focus has to be this change of consciousness that's our work today and this part of our series where we have dwelt on current affairs gave you a dark perspective of what's behind the scenes made you understand its consequences its influences in the world but also hopefully has empowered you to see through all this and to begin to make a change not only in external circumstances but now finally in your internal state of consciousness that you do this and all those would be inevitable if you don't do this you can overcome those external circumstances again and again but it will slip back to the old pattern because you have not changed you'll find yourself sucked into those aberrations because you're a victim of those forces which play with you so quickly looking at some of the questions um we say is above website seems to be inaccessible yes unfortunately it goes down repeatedly because uh, severe attacks from cabal interests as well as other forces which don't want that knowledge to be up just wait a day or two and suddenly you'll find it's back on track and um, connect every now and then it goes down but not too often nowadays because it relies on elon musk's spacex by the way for the internet connection so it's now much more reliable than it used to be madhuri asks can we make provision for recycling recycling of all plastic pens and refills etc yes of course all this is possible all plastic can be recycled reused also but recycled primarily if your cost of recycling is zero when the cost to recycle is as much as the product then you cannot afford to double the product cost so you throw away get the recycling with free energy you can spend 10 times more energy 10 times more cost to recycle not a problem because that component is free and that's why the free energy is so important all the problems of pollution can be resolved once your energy cost is zero and uh, Sagar says there are many people who have claimed that they met ET from the future that said that they are descendants from our race. Is it is time travel possible? So, in the physical world, as it seems, we are able to go back and see things in the past, even project ourselves into the future, reasonably close to the physical world in your subtle body, typically. But the future you see is one of many possibilities. the past you see is also sometimes a blend of things which happened as well as things which tried to happen distinguishing between those is difficult in that subtle state so any device which is able to see past or future is seeing possibilities and then to identify which of those possibilities was the past involves a certain skill so potentially yes we can do these things as it turns out we cannot modify the past we are only seeing it like a film but it can be a 3d film you're fully immersed in it in your subtle body in an out of body state you can see the past 
be in it live it but uh, you can't modify similarly you can go into the future see one of the possibilities push for its assertion tilt the balance and these are the kinds of things which shirvinder and the mother did but of course on a much different level on a higher level so as you go up the levels of consciousness from a higher level you can impact much more completely the turn of events and swing the future in the direction needed this was the work they did but this is the work we will do when we change our consciousness in the very act of freeing ourselves from a lower consciousness and growing into higher potential we have changed our destiny and by a ripple effect impacted the collectivity this is our priority this is a inevitable necessity in every way in terms of timelines all that i have described as i said potentially it's possible now of course from the time you begin it will take a few years maybe a decade or so to bring it to a point of stability this it will be a major disruption all values will be turned upside down but yes it should be we can it be done more smoothly yes very likely it will happen much more smoothly and it will take that much more time therefore but if you start looking at it from this point of view free energy free labor free resources food water etc reasonably easily taken care of liberated from all survival needs what do you do consciousness change becomes now the single most important thing so work for it and as you grow into it the gifts are waiting to be given they're just behind the veil so to say and will be given to you i've given the example of this teacher i who created the free energy machine in switzerland he would put it in this way ask nature and she will give you i will go a little further and say ask the divine and you will get all the knowledge necessary but are you now competent enough to receive and use it wisely and not destroy yourselves the divine gave us the gift of nuclear power we almost destroyed ourselves the divine gave us the gift of the knowledge of genetics we have done so much harm that it will be the future generations who will be cursing us for the harm we have done but hopefully still not to too too destructive so the question is really of our competence and so we come back to this question of growth of consciousness and the place of the integral yoga which is the framework which allows you not only to grow in consciousness but change your nature unlike existing yogic practices which all focus on liberating your consciousness abandoning nature for what it is human nature remains semi animal with a little bit of morality and ethics to improve but with the integral yoga you can change your nature and outgrow your animality and make your nature ready for a divine consciousness to be expressed a divine knowledge and wisdom a divine force and power a divine harmony and love and a divine perfection and beauty all these are our inevitable destiny we have to start taking an immediate next few steps focus on this this is why we are here and this is what we are speaking about if we are speaking in the context of sri aurobindo's and the mother's teachings so let's take a moment to concentrate on this this future which i have described is not so far i believe it is imminent but imminent in evolutionary terms can be anything from 10 years to 100 years depends on us so let's concentrate in this aspiration that these possibilities can be realized sooner rather than later orobil is one of those focal points let each one of us become the little focal point in the earth for the new consciousness to be realized namaste